First thing we're going to talk about is finding the area under a curve by hand when we have to use use substitution. It's very important uh, we pay attention to all the steps because something changes that we're not used to when we're using use substitution uh, to take the antiderivative of this when we have numbers here in our definite integral. First of all, recall using the fundamental theorem of calculus that if I want to find the area under a curve, we have to take the antiderivative and find the change between A and B. Well, I have to take the antiderivative of this. I'm going to have to use U substitution. I start by setting U equal to the inside of my composition. And I get the derivative is equal to 2x dx. I can solve for dx. And now I can go ahead and substitute and see what happens. So we'd have integral, leave the 3x, u squared, 1 over 2x, du. Now, typically when we are finding areas under a curve, our, our numbers, when we take the antiderivative, usually stay. So if this is a 0 and a 2, typically I'll just say, oh, you know, if I simplify it, it'll stay as a 0 and a 2. But this is actually incorrect. Okay. Once I switch from dx to du, I go from talking about an expression or a function that is graphed on an x-axis to an expression or a function that's graphed on the u-axis. Now, if I get rid of these x's, of course. It's just something on the u-axis, which means from 0 to 2 under 3x, x squared plus 2 squared is going to be different than from 0 to 2 under 3u squared times 1 half du. Okay, we kind of like shrink and contract things, and that means we'd have to change our boundaries. Okay, so we need to change boundaries when we change the du. is the key thing that you need to be wary of. Now, what are we going to put instead of 0 and 2? Well, 0 and 2 are x values. That's an x. That's an x. What u's would replace those x values? Well, it all depends on what you set u equal to. I set u equal to x squared plus 2. So if I have an x that is 0, u would be 0 squared plus 2, or 2. All of a sudden, what was 0 turns into a 2 as a u. And then if x is 2, we would get 2 squared plus 2, which is 6. An x that was 2 corresponds with a u that is 6. So I have to do this. This is proper. And now I can go ahead and take my antiderivative. I get u cubed multiplied by the reciprocal. That would be 1 third times the 3 uh, would just go away and just have 1 half u cubed. And we'd find the change in that between the u's that I have now 2 and 6. Or, we didn't have to do any of that. Why? What was the last step you guys do when you take the antiderivative of something using u substitution? This is my antiderivative plus the c. We know we don't need the plus c because we're finding the change. But what did you do on your answers? Did you leave use in your answer? No. no. What did you do, Mr. McBride? Yeah, you plugged back in what your u is equal to. Well, if I plug back in what my u is equal to, we don't need the plus c, of course. Well, guess what? These u's that I changed from 0 to 2 to 2 to 6, 
I'll have to change back to zero to two. Now, what we will notice is that we'll get the same exact answer when we're finding the change. Here and here, we'll produce the same, exa uh, same answer. I take six, six cubed times a half minus two cubed times a half is going to be the same as three squared, sorry, two squared plus two cubed times a half minus zero squared plus two cubed times a half. It ends up being the same thing. So you might be thinking, well, why do I have to worry about this? Well, there are certain problems where this change of these boundaries is all that the AP test wants you to know what to do, okay? So on your homework, you'll have a bunch of problems like this. I want you to be able to show that you could either find the change in this or go ahead and find the change in this. It's going to be the exact same answer. What's six cubed? Huge number? Doesn't matter. One half six cubed minus one half two cubed is what all of those things equal. Okay? Well, there are certain questions like this where you have to know how to change your variables and change your boundaries because you're going to be using u's instead of x's. Okay? So here's the question. It says, if the integral from 4 to 9 of f of 2x dx equals 6, what would be the equivalent definite integral using f of u instead of f of 2x? So it's asking you, what is this going to look like? What's going to be over here? What's going to be here? And what's going to be here? If this is what's given to us. Okay. I'll start you guys off. You guys do the rest. Well, you know you need f of u. Guess what you're going to have to set u equal to? 2x. Go ahead and do every single step that you're used to doing to kind of work out this. The only extra step you now need to be kind of careful of is this 4 and this 9. They're going to have to change because this is talking about Boundaries on an x-axis, we change it to boundaries on a u-axis. U-axis and an x-axis are just the same. or similar. They just look the same. It's just when we take our expression, kind of shrink it or expand it. Go ahead and compare an answer maybe to a neighbor. See what we get. Kind of tricky. This is a new type of problem that you're not used to seeing. All right, watch. This is the easy part, changing this 4 and 9 to 8 and 18, but so many students forget about doing it. Just don't forget in the future. We also replace dx with 1 half du. And if I do that, the 6 will stay here. This is still going to be equal to 6. It's just on a u-axis, we're talking about between 8 and 18. 
Well, if I wanted just f of u du and not a half, what can I do to get rid of that half? I could multiply both sides by 2. Remember, if we have a constant in an integral, we could take that constant out. And then I can go ahead and solve for the integral by multiplying both sides by 2. So actually, I'm looking for an answer that has an 8 and 18 here and here, but this integral is equal to 12. Just as a trick. Okay. Yes. No. They would only show this or this as a possible answer. And the other ones would be wrong. Something like this, if you're asked to do this on uh, your homework, I would expect you to show the two different ways to find the change in the antiderivative, one using u's and one using x's, just so that you know that you have to change your boundaries if you do use u's. Let me just show you quickly this one. I'd set u equal to that 2 thirds x, du is equal to 2 thirds dx, dx is equal to 3 halves du. Now here we go. If I use a new integral, I'll have cosine of u, 3 halves du, but let's see what our x's change to be. In, uh, change to be. If x is pi over 2, I plug in pi over 2, I get a u that is equal to 2 thirds pi over 2, which is pi over 3. And if I have an x that is 0, my u is equal to just 0. So this changes to 0 and pi over 3. Now we can go ahead and take the antiderivative of this, It'd be 3 halves sine u, the change between 0 and pi over 3. Or 3 halves sine 2x over 3, back to being from 0 to pi over 2. You should notice that if I plug in pi over 3 here, it's the same as plugging pi over 2 in here and multiplying it by 2 thirds. So this, finding the change in these, would produce the same answer. Sine of pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. So we'd have, no matter which way you do it, 3 halves root 3 over 2 minus 0, or um, 3 root 3 over 4 is your answer. Then we change the, uh, the boundaries. The boundaries. Yes. That's a good point. Is what I said, Mr. Owen. Um, everybody should listen. We change the boundaries if we're keeping u. If we know we're going to go back to x's, we could keep the same x's. Okay? However, it's important to note, and this is what I want to show and what you guys to show for me on your homework. I want you to show that you can either do this or this. So both ways, okay? Other questions, Mr. Thomas? Yeah. Okay. Just go ahead. Next step. Our next antiderivative rule we're going to learn is the antiderivative of e to the x. Well, what's the derivative of e to the x? e to the x, if you remember the derivative slope generating function for e is itself, well, guess what the antiderivative is? Itself, with a plus c. Okay? However, remember when we took derivatives of e to a power, we would use the chain rule, it would be e to that power times the derivative of the power. Well, we're going to have to take the antiderivative of stuff like that. Now, this came from the chain rule. We're going to have to use u substitution to undo the chain rule. So we'll talk about antiderivatives of e's where we have to use u substitution.
the key is we will typically, when we see an interesting e to a power, and we need to take the antiderivative, we will typically set u equal to the power in e. Okay? I'll show you the first one, you guys will do the second one. If I want to take the antiderivative of e to the 3x plus 1, I'll set u equal to that power, 3x plus 1. du is equal to 3dx. dx is equal to 1 third du. Let's go ahead and do our steps. Keep everything the same. This would turn into e to the u, 1 third du. Well, just like the antiderivative of e to the x is e to the x, the antiderivative of e to u is e to the u. This one-third is just a constant. Remember, if we have a constant in front of a function, we don't take the antiderivative of this constant. This antiderivative is not going to be one-third u times e to the u. The antiderivative is going to be just one-third e to the u plus c, which gives us one-third e to the 3x plus 1 plus c. Okay. A lot of people want to put in an extra x, like right here, one-third x, because they think, oh, the antiderivative of one-third is one-third x. But think about that. If I were to ask you to take the antiderivative of 3x squared, you wouldn't put a x next to this 3 and then take the antiderivative of this x squared, which is one-third x cubed. No. You just leave the 3 alone, multiply by the antiderivative of x squared. Cool? So no x here. This x does not belong. Okay? Questions about that? Go ahead and do this one. Take your answers with a neighbor. Go ahead and check your answers. All is right in the world, those x's will cancel. You got negative 5 halves e to the u. You need to take the antiderivative of that. That's negative 5 halves e to the u plus c, or e to the negative x squared plus c. Okay, so the antiderivative of this is this. Now, what I find is that students, when they deal with e's and how things don't change when you take the antiderivative of e's, you forget with other u substitution problems that you have to change things. If this was you know, the antiderivative of negative 5 halves x squared or u squared, well, you have to take the antiderivative of the u squared, 1 third u cubed. Just don't forget that stuff. 
make sure you keep your operations. This is your operation. Take the antiderivative. You take the antiderivative. Uh, what would be the antiderivative of 5 to the x? 5 to the x? Um, it would be... 1 over log 5 times 5 to the x. Remember the derivative of 5 to the x was 5 to the x log 5? This one, you'd have to like get rid of that log 5. And L is uh, the log of each case 1, right? Yep. Okay. You don't have to worry about this, though. Yeah, I was just wondering why right. Um, it's just because of the derivative. Yeah, the derivative being the same thing. It's just easy to very special number when it comes to exponentially growing things. Uh, this one, it's easy. I'll just show you the first steps that u equal to 1 over x, you'd find the same answer. This one is kind of a step zero to do first before you take the antiderivative. Go ahead and do this one. See if you know how to do that step zero and then find the correct antiderivative. What's step zero, Mr. Snowden? Exactly. Rewrite this as e to the negative x. Now you can use u substitution, or you could just kind of figure out it's got to be negative e to the negative x plus c as the antiderivative. Okay? So, just like derivatives of e's are easy, antiderivatives of e's, not that bad. Well, we also have to talk about our other guy that deals with E's and undoes E's, the log function. Okay? Let's remember what the derivative of the log function is. What's the derivative of log of X? Anybody remember? 1 over X is correct. Well, that means the antiderivative of 1 over x is what? It's got to be log x, right? This is really interesting. A lot of students really have trouble remembering this and kind of keeping this in their brains. Why? Because whenever we deal with something like that, what do we usually do? We typically rewrite things and we use a power rule. So typically when you see like 1 over x squared, you guys say, all right, we'll rewrite this as x to the negative second, and I can take the antiderivative. That's x to the negative first times negative 1 plus c. Well, watch what happens with the power rule when I have just 1 over x. Go ahead and try to find the antiderivative of 1 over x using the power rule. See what happens. You turn that into x to the negative first. And then you add 1, you get x to the 0. And then you multiply by the reciprocal. What's the reciprocal of 0? Yeah, undefined 1 over 0 plus c. Well... Tell me that if I take the derivative of this, I get 1 over x, and we know that's not true. Okay? The power rule for antiderivatives does not work for x to the negative first.
which is funny because we've done so many antiderivatives so far, so many of them. Not one that you've seen so far on any of our quizzes or on our tests had 1 over x in them. Not one. Because we knew you would have gotten this and you would have been confused and you would have been like, that can't be right. And you would have been right, that can't be right. And then you'd have been like, well, what is, what is the answer? What's the antiderivative? And then I'd have to have been like, remember the derivative of log x? It's 1 over x. Well, that's the antiderivative. Instead, boom, we just said, don't give them any problems involving 1 over x. We'll get to it later. And now we know because it's special, it doesn't use the power rule. It's just the antiderivative of 1 over x is log x. Okay? But it's a little bit more complicated for that because log x is only defined when x is greater than 0. Log x looks like this. Ln x. Okay, so it's true that the positive version of 1 over x is the derivative of log x. If I look at the slopes of the tangents of log x, I'd get the values of 1 over x when x is greater than 0. Well, that means the antiderivative of 1 over x is equal to just log x when x is greater than 0. But 1 over x is defined for x is not equal to 0. 1 over x goes over here as well. Well, that means I kind of need to expand its antiderivative for when x is not equal to 0. And turns out if I have this, and I look at the slopes of the tangents for this piece, the slopes of the tangents for that would give me the values of 1 over x there, and that would make sense. Well, what is this graph now? This is the graph of y equals log of absolute x. So if x's are greater than 0, this is true. But if we're talking about all x's excluding 0, we need an absolute value so that we can expand the domain of log. Okay, both of these you got to have to be aware of. You are always safe to put an absolute value, always, 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 that'll always work. But if a question defines the x's as being greater than zero, you don't need the absolute value because you know you'll be able to take the log of all those values. And that kind of leads me to the derivative of log of absolute x. It's just going to be 1 over x. And it's just for all x's except for 0. Okay? So, remember, if you see an x to the negative first, don't use the power rule. It doesn't work. It gives you 1 over 0 times x to the 0. That doesn't make sense. Instead, remember that the antiderivative of 1 over x or x to the negative first is the log of the absolute of x. Remember this. Okay. Well, we need to also remember how to, Mr. Lin. need an absolute, just to be careful, of our domain. Okay. Well, we also need to remember how to take the derivatives of log of stuff. Who remembers, or who could tell me what the derivative of log of 3x cubed plus 2 is? Mr. Buckner, Bracken, yep. 1 over x log x, or is it log? Yeah. Nope. Nope. Good, Miss Ellis. We remember if it's log of stuff, the derivative of log of stuff is 1 over the stuff. Well, if we have stuff, we have to multiply by the derivative of the stuff. So this derivative is 1 over the stuff times derivative of this stuff. Chain rule, right? Well, guess what we're going to be doing? We are going to be taking something that will look like that, and we'll have to take the antiderivative. How are we going to do that? 
we're going to use use substitution. So we need to be ready for that. Now, before we go to those, uh, these <coughs> use substitution ones, let's just take some easy antiderivatives of x to a negative first power, like this. Questions? Take this guy on the left. We got 3 over 5x. What's the antiderivative of that? Well, you might think, oh, I'm going to rewrite this. I'm going to do step 0. I'm going to make this 3 fifths x to the negative first. Does that help me? Well, not if you try to use the power rule, because the power rule is not going to work, because it's x to the negative first. Instead, maybe instead of writing it like that, you write it like this, 3 fifths times 1 over x, and you just remember, oh yeah, the power rule doesn't work for x to the negative first, which is the same as 1 over x. The antiderivative of 1 over x is just log x. So this is just 3 fifths log absolute x. What else? Yeah, you can just always assume that the domain is all possible x values. Okay. For this one, this is a step zero guy. We will have to rewrite things, but again, if I have an x to the negative first, that doesn't help me. Probably just keep it as 1 over x because the antiderivative of 1 over x is the log of absolute x. So I do the step 0. I can now take the antiderivative. Okay. All right, so those are easy ones. You just have to know where they come from. Let's talk about ones where we need some use substitution. When we have x to the negative first power, or 1 over x, times stuff, we typically set u equal to the denominator. Now, I'm going to do the first one on the left, show you how you can do it with u substitution, but you kind of don't need u substitution for either of those. Watch. If I set u equal to my denominator, I got that 4x minus 1. The du would be equal to 4dx. dx is equal to 1 fourth du. I will go ahead and substitute in u. Substitute for dx, and I get that. Now, again, we have 1 over u. It's the same as like 1 over x. The antiderivative is just log absolute. Well, notice we just need the 1 fourth in front of the log of my stuff. That's in the denominator. So you started with this guy. And we ended up just with the log of what we had times the reciprocal of my constant in front of that 4. For these, you can kind of just figure this out, and you don't have to use u substitution for these. For example, if I have 1 over 5 minus 2x, I can just figure out that, oh, I mean, if you can think about the derivative of this, it would be 1 over my stuff times the derivative of my stuff. It would be 1 over 4x minus 1 times 4. I need to get rid of that 4 with the 1 fourth so that I have that. Same deal here. We could kind of figure out that I need a negative 1 half before the log of my stuff in that denominator. If you take the derivative of this, that negative 1 half would get rid of this negative 2 which is the derivative of the inside. Okay, so you can, for these, 
easy enough to go straight from here to here. And the key is just to understand how to take the derivative of this stuff. So the derivative that we did before, derivative of maybe this, you got to realize it's leave the one half, one over my stuff times the derivative of my stuff. There's that five minus two x. This and this go away. We have what I have here. Okay. But if you wanted to, if you were unsure, you could use u substitution. Set u equal to my denominator. For the next couple, you'll definitely need to use u substitution. Now we have a situation here where we will have a log in our antiderivative, but the key to recognizing the situation is that I have one power greater in the denominator than my numerator. Or the numerator is the power of the derivative of my denominator. If I see something like this, I should be thinking, okay, u substitution, set u equal to my denominator, and watch this stuff will cancel. Go ahead and do that. You can't do step zero here. You can't simplify this. But you have to use u substitution. Check your answers with a neighbor. That's the hard part setting u and then doing these steps correctly, the x's will cancel. Antiderivative of 1 half times 1 over u is just going to be 1 half log absolute u, which is just 1 half log absolute at x squared plus 1. Whenever it's bigger by a degree of one, just by a degree of one, then it's set up perfectly where this is uh, this is the derivative, a version of the derivative of this. Uh, let's look at something like that. We notice that secant squared is the derivative of tangent, so I said u equal to that denominator. Watch how the secant squares will go away. Now it's just the antiderivative of 1 over u. It's easy, log absolute u. Well, kind of understanding that, 
leads us to the antiderivative of tangent of x. Go ahead and figure this out. I'll give you a hint. Start by rewriting it as sine over cosine. Find the antiderivative of tangent. It seems like it's got to be so simple, but it's not. Compare with a neighbor what you have for the antiderivative of tangent. Denominator. Denominator, not the numerator. Good. Good. It's not only denominator if it's like one more power on the bottom. Well, the reason why it's one more power on the bottom is because the top is the derivative of the bottom. So, like in the other ones, the reason why it's one more power is because this is a version of the derivative of this. Mm. This is the derivative of a version of that. So once we have sines and cosines, it's the same process. This is a derivative of that. Okay. okay. Uh, what's the antiderivative of 1 over u? There you go. So you pretty much have it. No catch. Just interesting antiderivatives. So it turns out if we take the derivative of log of absolute of cosine x and the opposite of that, we get tangent. Bloop, bloop. Antiderivative of negative 1 over u is negative log absolute u plus c, which is the same as negative log absolute cosine x plus c. If you took the derivative of this, you would see that it's just going to be tangent, right? The derivative of log is 1 over your stuff times the derivative of your stuff. So I'd have 1 over cosine times negative sine times the negative makes it positive sine over cosine makes it positive tangent. Before you leave, what should we set u equal to for this one? Log of x is correct. Why log of x? Because the du would end up canceling with the x. That 1 over x would cancel with the x. Okay, you'll see that on your uh, homework. The log of u plus c ends up being the log of the log of x plus c.